All right. Welcome, everybody, to our developing inquisitive and reflective instruction session during our Summer of Powerful Learning series. Uh, we have a wonderfully spectacular session set up for all of you today, uh, and I'm going to let our presenter introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Megan Pattenhouse. I'm a project director here on the learning experience design team at Digital Promise. I am a former teacher myself and have spent the last 10 years or so helping teachers to implement technology in the classroom. Um, and I am really excited today to dig into what it means to support truly inquisitive and reflective instruction in our classrooms. Excellent. And I'm Todd DeSando. I'm going to be your moderator. I'm an instructional technology trainer here at Digital Promise on the uh, Ville side. So a few norms to go over uh, as we get started. Number one, mute your microphone uh, and unmute it to speak if uh, the time comes for that. But always, always, always use the chat uh, if you have comments or questions or um, the presenter wants you to interact with any of the content um, that she's going over. Be mindful and be present. These two things kind of go hand in hand. Uh, we know that it's the summer and we're kind of out, out on the, the, you know, the back nine of the summer, so to speak. Uh, but we are all here for the same reason. So be mindful of that reason. We're all here to learn. So be present as you possibly can. And last but not least, be kind to yourself and others in here. Uh, again, we're all on the same team and we're all here for the same reason. Megan, back to you. Great. And in the spirit of inquiry, we are going to start by sharing in the chat. Um, I'd love to just hear about something that you have been really curious about lately. Um, the curiosity rabbit hole that I have been going down recently is um, multi-level marketing. Um, I've watched the Lula Row documentary. Um, I've watched the Vice documentary, uh, Betting on Zero. I've read books about it. I'm just really interested in it and I cannot get enough. And I just have a lot of questions um, around how it works and why it works. Um, so that is a rabbit hole that I've been going down recently. And I'd love to hear what is piquing your curiosity, something you have a lot of questions about or have started to explore. I've been very curious about uh, how people make decisions, how the decisions are made, and what if, what goes on in someone's mind when it comes to making a decision, whether or not it's an academic decision, a world decision, something like that. So I've been reading a lot of work um, around that to understand, I'll get a better understanding of that. Great. Thanks for sharing that. That made me want to go down that rabbit hole. I'd love if you shared in the chat a couple of the resources that you've been learning more about decision making from. Great, Gloria shared in the chat, navigating some tech tools. Um, already thinking about getting back into the school year this fall. Great. Someone's interested in AI in the classroom, which is actually the area that I'm spending a lot of my time in recently. So um, I'll mm -hmm. make sure to share my email at the, at the end and you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, great. Alice is interested in how personality types can affect the way a teacher presents information. Um, hoping you got a chance to either attend some of our other sessions where we are thinking and talking about learner variability. Um, that's definitely related. Um, if not, I think we have those um, recordings available for everyone to, to watch. Um, great. So keep sharing those um, curiosity rabbit holes that you are interested in exploring in the chat. Um, and we're going to go ahead and dive in today. Um, hopefully there were some interesting topics in there. We'll have an opportunity if you're so interested to collaborate later today. So those are some things you might um, chat about with folks in our breakout groups. Um, so today we are looking at ways that we can support inquiry 
within our curriculum. Um, we know that most curriculums are not designed with inquiry in mind. We have standards, we have content we need to cover, and uh, our curriculums are mostly designed in order to make sure that we cover all that content and is not necessarily explicitly designed to really support what students are interested in learning about, what they have questions about. Um, so we're gonna look at some of the ways that we can build that in to the constraints that we have to build student agency and motivation. And then we're also gonna look at the reflection piece. So explore some strategies for space recall and reflection because we know that that really strengthens student learning. So inquisitive and reflective is one of our powerful learning uh, principles, one of our sets of principles. And they're really about this kind of uh, past and future orientation. We know that they help us to build enduring learning um, because not only are students doing the learning now, but if we build the ability to ask good questions and engage in true inquiry, we're giving them tools to learn in the future, to learn about things that we may not be there to support them through. We're going to build those inquiry skills so that they have that ability to be lifelong learners and know how to investigate and research and understand something that is unfamiliar to them. We also have that part that reaches into the past, that the, the things we've already learned, um, we need opportunities to integrate reflection into our instructional practice to um, strengthen students' memory about what they have learned um, so that they can apply that to those questions and investigations that they're doing in the future. Um, and as always, these are based in um, learning sciences research. So we know that inquiry is a vehicle for understanding um, it actually helps us to um, build our schema and to um, build guiding questions that help us to make connections to our learning. We know that connecting to that background knowledge is really important um, for student learning and inquiry is a way to extend that beyond what they already know. They're applying that background knowledge to a new area of understanding. Um, so this is where students are gonna work together to ask questions, seek answers, make connections. Um, and really amplify their engagement into that deeper learning. We also know that recall supports memory. So um, it shows that learning sciences research shows that the way in which um, reflection is designed has a really big impact that we can't actually um, learn and reflect at the same time and that our learning does not happen um, as deeply if we don't take that time for reflection. So one of the ways that you can support that is through retrieval practice, um, maybe scaffolding a review of a skill throughout the year, not just at that particular time that you learn it. Um, and spacing out that learning and recall over time really helps to improve um, students' understanding of that topic and ability to recall it later so that learning is deeper and longer lasting. We also know that reflection supports deeper learning in context. So we talked about how um, reflection helps students to um, actually remember what it is that they learned. Um, it also connects back to that inquiry piece uh, because they have a deeper understanding of the things that they've learned. Um, they're able to apply that knowledge that they've gained into other learning contexts, with, whether that's through inquiry um, or other means of learning about the world. Um, and this doesn't have to be complicated. You can use something as simple as Project Zero's, um, I used to think X and now I think Y to help kids be more aware of their knowledge structures and how their um, beliefs are explicitly expressed um, within their work. Uh, and taking time is also important for us as educators. If we don't take a time to reflect on the practices that we're using, we're not actually gonna internalize that learning that we've done um, through being with and working with our students all day. So it's important for both our students and for us to set time aside um, to allow us to internalize what it is that we've learned um, and to give us some tools for engaging in reflection in different ways so that we can take away different pieces from that learning. So all, all of the point of this together is that inquiry and reflection are really the cornerstone to students becoming expert learners who can drive their own learning. Um, this really builds on some of the other principles. I hope you've had a chance to um, explore some of those, but really in order for students to become those expert learners, they need to know how to get, ask 
good questions and they need to have the ability to reflect on what it's what they've learned and how that applies to um, other things that they are learning about. So we are bought into this idea that we want our students to be asking good questions. Uh, we want to give them time to reflect, but we want some strategies to be able to do that. Um, so one of the key pieces to this is really thinking about how you are supporting risk-taking. We know that students um, ask less questions as they go on in the grades. Um, so um, when students are three or four, they're asking why this, why that, how does this work? Um, and actually through the process of school, um, because what we value is not questions but answers most of the time, it can make it really scary for students to ask questions. Um, maybe they have had folks in their life who are tired of them asking questions and wish they would ask less questions, or they're really used to that answer orientation. Um, and so this really requires a shift for both students and teachers that brings in some of that vulnerability. And so we need to build a classroom culture that supports risk-taking and question asking. The other piece there is that we need to explicitly teach students about how to ask good questions. Um, if this is not something that we're teaching explicitly, um, students might lean into some of those lower level questions, which are not as interesting. Um, the, the who, the what, the where um, are good things to start with, but they are not things that spark deep curiosity um, all the time. So we need to help students build capacity around asking great questions. And that's something we're going to spend um, quite a bit of time on today. And the other piece is using wait time. There's a lot of cognitive uh, function that goes into asking those good questions that help students assess their environment to understand if they can take a risk. Um, so because we know that there's a lot of cognition happening, it's important that we build in wait time so that students have an opportunity to think through what their questions might be, whether they feel that they're in a safe space to share some of those questions, um, think about some possibly different questions that they might have and evaluate which ones they think are most important. And it can feel awkward. We want to um, keep the conversation going, but we know that it's really important to give students time to think before we share out. Um, one of the other pieces here, um, when we get into inquiry and actually answering some of those um, questions that students have, uh, one of the challenges there can be that um, unlike how we might control other um, information in the classroom, when students are asking the questions, they might ask about something we know nothing about. Um, they might ask about some, every student might ask about something different, and I might not have the resource of time to figure out exactly what every student needs. And I'm not always gonna be there in order to scaffold that experience for students. So I need to explicitly teaching, be teaching students how to evaluate sources, to know whether the information that they're using to answer those lines of inquiry is valid information, whether they should believe it, um, whether they should put stock in that information. And then finally, intentionally building in time for reflection and synthesis. We talked about this just a few minutes ago. Um, this is often something that we're like, oh yes, at the end of the lesson, we're gonna have an exit ticket. We're gonna have an opportunity to think about what we learned today. And because time gets away from us so often, this is often the part of our lesson that gets skipped. But we know that when we don't leave that time and space for reflection, that our students are not learning the material as deeply. Um, so this is something that I have tried to do in my own practice to be really um, strict with myself about not letting this fall off the wagon because I've prioritized other things and really trying to prioritize that time for reflection and synthesis um, consistently. So when we're thinking about what students are doing, part of asking good questions is asking a lot of questions. Not all of those questions are gonna be great right off the bat. This is something we're gonna do today when we are engaging and asking our questions um, ourselves. We want to be asking lots of questions so we can find those really meaty, good, interesting questions. The next piece of that is iterating and improving on your questions. When you generate all those different ideas about um, possible lines of inquiry, you may not ask the good, meaty questions right off the bat. And so we need to lean into that idea of iterating and improving. Um, relates back to that risk-taking culture that we just talked about building. 
is that we can make something better. We can improve on something. It doesn't have to be perfect on the first time. We also talked about that evaluating credibility of sources. That's something that we want to see students doing when they're engaging deeply in inquiry um, is not taking everything at face value and really being able to understand where the information is coming from, why the author might be saying it that way, um, what other places might corroborate the claim that's being made um, or the information that's being shared. And then in terms of the reflection process, we want students to be able to articulate their learning and how they learned it. Again, we're building towards students becoming expert learners. And in order to do that, they need to be able to understand what the learning process is and how they engaged in it so they can understand how to apply that to future inquiry or future learning. So there are a lot of ways that technology can support um, inquisitive and uh, reflective instruction. Um, the first one is helping students to find out what things they're interested in learning about. Um, so two resources that are great for helping students to find topics that they might be interested in exploring more or learning more about are Wonderopolis or How Stuff Works. Um, they have different levels of um, content. So this is not just for one particular grade level, but these are great ways to help students explore different things about the world that might help them generate some questions. We also talked about that research and evaluation piece. Um, so this is one of my favorite tools um, to teach about uh, evaluating your sources. This is the Northwest Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus website um, that I love to use for teaching students how to evaluate information. Um, it often tricks students because it looks very real. They've got pictures there. They've got a lot of scientific information, um, but this does not actually exist. Um, so this is a great resource. I, I um, have worked with teachers a lot around media literacy and often the um, complaint is it's hard to, to get something to teach them what not to look for. So this is one of the good resources that I would use for that. Um, All Sides is a great way to help students understand media bias um, and what things All Sides looks at to determine what kind of bias a particular source might have. It helps students to be able to see um, things where they might look for information from someone who has a different point of view on a particular topic. Um, and then there's always just the making sure that students have access to information that's um, well vetted in on their reading level. And Newzella and ReadWorks are two resources that I really love for helping students to conduct their own inquiry um, because they're able to find uh, information that is um, already vetted. So if you're in the stage where you're still teaching those media literacy skills and you need to practice the inquiry skills um, and you need to scaffold uh, some of that media evaluation piece by limiting students to look for information on these two places. Um, that can be a good way to scaffold that skill while you're building up those skills around, okay, if we just look on Google, um, how are we gonna know whether we should trust the information that we see there? Oops. All of those are linked. So if you have access to the slide deck, um, that is a great way to get access to all of these resources. And then all of this engaging in uh, inquiry and reflection requires a ton of executive functioning. Uh, we are asking, we're shifting a lot of the work from ourselves as the teacher to our students. And in order to help them do all of that work, we need to provide them with some supports in order to manage all of that processing that they're doing um, in their brains and in their learning. So um, this is an example of a inquiry process that I actually conducted with teachers. Um, we used Jamboard to help them organize all of their different questions and categorize them. Um, here they had some questions around the process of inquiry, um, the teacher role in inquiry, and the environment that encourages inquiry, as well as some of the things that students are doing. So this was a tool that we used to support all of the different things that are going on in their brains as they're learning to help organize and keep track of those. It might also look like putting together some kind of tracker. This is one that I used um, with that same group of teachers to help them organize their inquiry. They categorized 
um, the different guiding questions that they had. They thought through some of the places that they might look for um, resources that help to answer that question. Maybe it's going to be online. Maybe it's going to be in a social network or a game. Um, they figured out who was researching that particular question and had a status about whether they had were still investigating it or whether they'd completed their investigation and then a place to organize their findings. So this can be a good way to help students visualize what this process of inquiry looks like and particularly to support some of that executive functioning around collaboration to help students figure out how to work with each other and collaborate around an area of inquiry. Um, and then some tools for reflection are really um, figuring out how we can leverage technology to make more time for this. Um, we talked about this being the piece of the lesson that often falls off at the end of the, the period, um, or we maybe have not found different ways to engage students in reflection. Um, Flipgrid is a great tool for this. You can have everyone share just a little blip at the end of class. They can add visuals, they can add audio, they can add video. Um, just doing an audio reflection with Vokuru is also a great option. It's super quick, students, uh, it's really accessible. Students, if they have a device, are able to just record a quick note on what they learned from today, and then you're able to kind of review those. I had one teacher who um, just listens to all of the notes on the way home, um, which is a great way to fit it into your day. Um, and then social media, I know, can be a touchy topic for some districts, it really depends on your district policy, but I've seen some teachers use Twitter or um, TikTok very effectively as ways to connect their students with an authentic audience um, to share their reflections and their learnings. I've even seen in places where maybe that's against your district policy. This is a teacher created um, a little piece that looked like a tweet um, to get them to summarize their learning. So they weren't actually sharing that on a social media platform, but they were emulating it. Same with TikTok, using it in create only mode um, and students are not actually sharing that out, but they're still making um, that video content and submitting it to you to share their reflections around their learning. And then my favorite one, um, which we'll do at the end of our uh, lesson or our webinar today is creating memes. Um, students love memes and it is a great way for students to synthesize their learning and reflect on it. Um, here's one of my favorite is the to be or not to be tough decision meme um, for Shakespeare. Um, I am not a physicist, so I don't fully understand this meme that students shared, um, but clearly one of those um, formulas is very much preferable to the other. And then this was one of my favorite examples was um, a student made a uh, meme of what the Tinder profile of a pluripotent stem cell might look like to demonstrate their understanding of that stem cell. So I'm gonna pause there. I'd love for you to share in the chat um, how we're doing with the content so far today. Um, you can give me a one, two, or a three. So one is I'm still a little fuzzy on inquiry and reflection. Two is I understand it, um, but I'm still working through how to apply it. And three is I'm feeling really great. I could explain this to others. I understand why it's important and what it would look like in my classroom to implement it. Great, I love, we got lots of twos, some two and a half. So we're well on our way there. We've got one, three. Um, I think that's the perfect place for us to be right now heading into um, our activity for today. So hopefully that will allow you to move from that two to that three. Um, so that we're gonna actually apply this. We're gonna be asking lots of questions ourselves. We're gonna be iterating on our questions, improving on them um, by engaging in QFT or the question formulation technique. So I'm gonna share a quick video. This is the question formulation technique in 90 seconds. And then we're actually gonna hop into doing a QFT ourselves. Hey there, Aaron here from InquireEd. The question formulation technique, often referred to as the QFT, was developed by the Right Question Institute as a simple step-by-step -step process that helps anyone produce, improve, and prioritize questions. It's a powerful strategy, and that's why we're here with a 90-second breakdown of how the QFT can work in your classroom. 
The QFT starts with a Q focus, the spark that jumpstarts the production of questions. The Q focus can be a statement, image, phrase, or situation, as long as it is clear and interesting enough to activate curiosity. One hard and fast rule, though, the Q focus can't be a question. Before you start producing questions, pick someone to write down and number the questions as they come. Then review the rules. Rule number one, generate as many questions as possible. Rule number two, do not discuss, answer, or judge any questions. Rule number three, write down every question exactly as it is stated. Rule number four, change any statements to questions. Take four to five minutes to produce questions using a timer to keep you on task. Once you're done, it's time to improve your questions. Set your timer for another four to five minutes, then categorize questions into open and closed, labeling each with a C or an O. Next, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of both types of questions. Finally, change one open question to closed and vice versa. Okay, only a few more steps. First, Prioritize your questions, setting the timer for three minutes and placing an X next to your top three. Don't forget to discuss why you've chosen them. Afterwards, take another two minutes to discuss and plan your next steps, describing what you'll do with your questions. Don't forget to reflect on what you've done and what you've learned. And that's a 90 second breakdown of the QFT. Now go ask some questions. All right, I know that was extremely fast. This is linked in the deck if you want to go back to it at any point. Um, but I wanted us hey there. to jump into actually applying the QFT so that we get a chance to engage with it a little bit more deeply. Um, so there are two ways you can engage in this. You can just go through the QFT process um, by picking your own topic, producing your own questions, improving them, and then prioritizing them. Um, and then as always, stopping to reflect on that whole process. Um, I also, I will show you, um, have a, um, a guide for actually doing this with your students, which you can work through. Each of the um, steps has a document that you can copy to engage in the steps of the slide. So for example, um, asking the questions, um, it's got some reflection built right into it. There is um, a slideshow that you can use to jump off from if you don't if you don't want to come up with a Q focus. Um, there's one already in here that you can use um, by taking a look at this picture and generating questions about it. Um, so you're going to work your way through each step of the QFT. I'd spend just a couple minutes on each. I think we have about 30 minutes to engage with this and we have um, five steps. So maybe spend um, a couple of, of minutes on maybe five minutes on step one, and then three minutes each on the following steps. We're gonna have multiple ways for you to engage. We have a couple of different breakout rooms. If you, you will be able to choose um, the room that you wanna be in. We have a totally silent room. If you wanna work with your, be muted with your camera off and work in silence, we have a room for you. If you wanna not interact with people, work with your camera off on mute, but have like some nice music and a good um, ambiance, we'll have a room for that. We'll have a couple of rooms for collaboration if you wanna work through this with folks together. And then finally, I will have a room if you're not quite understanding how to engage with the activity or you have additional questions about it, um, you can hop into that room with me and then move on to whichever room you prefer um, once you've got your questions answered. So I think Todd is going to go ahead and open up those breakout rooms for us so that you can start working through your question formulation technique. In the rooms. I know that that was a short, uh, probably shorter time than we were hoping for, um, but hopefully you got a chance to start to explore the QFT method um, and start generating some questions. Um, I know as part of my reflection from my learning design, um, I had some questions around 
should I be looking at this as a teacher or engaging as a student? Um, hopefully, whichever lens you looked at it through um, gave you some ideas for how you can use in your classroom. And next time I will design the activity to be a little bit more specific to that. But hopefully you have resources that you can use directly in your classroom. Um, that's why I specifically went with that particular resource because it has forms and sheets and things that you can copy and use directly with your students. Um, so hopefully you've got lots of things going into your classroom in the fall that you can use to help your students to generate more inquiry. Um, to practice what I preach, we talked about having time for reflection being really important. So I wanted to close out um, today with my favorite reflection activity, which is to create a meme. Um, while you all were um, finishing up your QFTs, I went and um, put mine in. Um, we'll put a link in the chat to this meme generator. Um, you can make a copy of it and then you'll be able to edit it. Um, I made mine. This is my face when I successfully leave time at the end of the lesson for reflection. Um, but you can choose any of the other faces and I'd love to hear, uh, see your meme reflect some of your learning from today. So we're gonna take just a couple of minutes and then when you've got that, you can go ahead and put it on our Padlet, which we will also pop into the chat. Megan, it's okay if we use a GIF, right? Or um... absolutely. Okay, good. Okay. Only if you call it a GIF. GIF's peanut. Well, butter. listen. I am I'm Team um... GIF. <laughs> oh no, I'm done getting <laughs> double teamed. Sorry, Todd. You're out of here. <laughs> Discussions that will go down for the rest of history, right? GIF or GIF. Great, I'm seeing our first meme come in. Remember when you got your meme, you can add it to the Padlet and you're welcome to just add a GIF or GIF, whatever you prefer um, to the Padlet and create your meme right on there. I'm very complimented by whoever made the Winnie the Pooh meme. Thank you very much. And you can keep finishing up those memes. I'd love to keep them, see them keep coming through. We're gonna finish up today. I wanna honor your time and finish on time. If you wanna keep working on your meme, go for it. Um, but I wanna give some time for Todd to share out a last couple announcements. 
All right, everybody, as our time uh, is coming to a close, um, I'm going to be dropping in the chat the link to the survey uh, for today's session. Please fill that out because that not also logs your attendance, um, but it also allows you to provide feedback on today's session. And yes, we do read every single one of them. Um, also, while you're filling that out, if you uh, request it, um, you'll also receive a certificate of completion um, via the email address that you use in the survey. Um, I think that comes pretty quickly, actually. I, I don't think you have to wait on that either. Um, so please fill that out. We do only have one more session uh, left in our series. Uh, unfortunately, back to school means uh, the end of our Summer of Powerful, Powerful Learning series. So uh, if you have not signed up for our last session, that is next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to throw the link in the chat for that as well. It's the same uh, web address that you went to to sign up for this session as well. Uh, also on that, and I want to bring attention to this because I had received multiple questions about this, all of the previous sessions for the entirety of this series uh, are on there as well. So if there is a session that you missed, uh, or if this is the first time that you are joining us, and this was the first um, uh, session that you were able to, um, to come to, you can go back and look at any of the previous sessions as well. All of the, the video links are there um, on that same website. So make sure you check that out too. Last is our Verizon Innovative Learning HQ. Uh, this is our HQ portal, verizon.com slash learning. And this has a ton of resources on it, including professional learning, access to AR and VR apps, lesson plans, and much more. So if you haven't checked that out as well, uh, give a little bit of time and uh, navigate to that. And last but not least is just our thank you for spending some of your summer time with us. Uh, and thank you to Megan, our presenter, uh, for facilitating this uh, spectacular session. Uh, thanks to you. So if we can give her a little reaction in the, in the chat, I'm going to give her some claps because that was a, a great session. And Megan, we what is your Twitter access. handle? That's, that's a question in the chat. Yes, my Twitter handle is at M Patton House and I'm M Patton House at digitalpromise.org if you want to reach out to me. Thank you all for, again, spending some of your summer with us and your fantastic memes. I really appreciate uh, your participation today. <laughs>